those words of Genesis were scratched on tablets and parchment many, many years ago, after a man crawled out of his caves and began the ages-long process of exploring his universe and himself. Today, a great new chapter has been added to the story of creation and of growth. Man literally has wrenched himself away from the earth that bound him down through the millennia. He has soared to the moon, he has seen and shown it close. He has come back safe. That is the meaning of the mission of Apollo 8, humankind's first flight into the orbit of the moon, an event sure to be written larger on the books of history than almost any our generation has seen. A year of trouble and turbulence, anger and assassination is now coming to an end in incandescent triumph. Apollo 8 achieved every one of its major mission aims and something else. It lifted the spirits of earthbound mortals and carried them to, if only for a while, out of their own horizons. Let there be light in the firmament of the heaven, said Genesis. Today there is a new light, and in the next hour we will look at its reflection. This is a broadcast about the flight of Apollo 8. This is a CBS News special report, Man at the Moon. The flight of Apollo 8. America's greatest space triumph and one of man's most remarkable achievements to date is the result of work by thousands of people and outlays of billions of dollars. We've seen, heard, and talked a great deal about the sophisticated hardware that lifted the astronauts away from the Earth, guided them so accurately to and from the moon, and kept us in touch and informed about their progress. But the three men, Borman, Lovell, and Anders, were the heart and soul of the mission, although their very human personalities tended to be submerged beneath their cool, smoothly functioning technical skill. But they carried with them man's many hopes and dreams about someday leaving his planet. And in interviews with David Schumacher in Houston, prior to the flight, they revealed how they felt. I'd like to be on the first team. And uh, I think that friendly competition uh, uh, among groups, among nations, among people is always healthy. I think the competition which we have uh, in space between the Soviet Union and ourselves is very healthy. Uh, and, uh, of course, I'd like to be the first around. Me, uh, not saying the, uh, the complete truth, I didn't feel that I hoped that uh, our flight uh, or, a, or a flight of Americans will be uh, the first to see the, uh, the backside of the moon. I don't believe that the, uh, the program as a whole would have survived as well after the fire if we wouldn't have had this momentum and this desire to complete this goal. That was a good idea. Uh, you know, we've been... Uh, planning this flight for years and years, and sometimes uh, when you read about it and hear it for so long, uh, you think that the goal is uh, academic, you know. You don't really finally understand that you're really going to try something like this, and now it's getting closer, and uh, we're not just talking about something in the future. We're talking about something right now. The goal to me is just as important as it was back in 1961. I think that uh, what risks there are have been well considered and designed for, to uh, attempt to alleviate these risks. And I think that the gain that we will get to our Apollo program and uh, the gain that uh, our country and the, all the nations in the world will receive from uh, this first step of exploration will certainly make any risk I might take uh, more than worth it. We've taken a rather conservative approach to this first lunar mission. Uh, it's one that makes sense. We're doing it uh, where we, we only have to bother or concern ourselves with one vehicle. We don't have to train for a rendezvous or a lunar landing. And uh, really, uh, you know, this is the program we've been working on for almost 10 years now, so uh, there's a lot of good hard engineering in it. I, I don't really uh, think we've left anything unturned. I hope we haven't. Of course, you'll never know until we finally do it. So these three quiet men prepared for what Commander Frank Borman later was to call a fantastic voyage. As head of the three-man Apollo crew, Borman already was a veteran of the space program. He became an astronaut six years ago after a career in aviation which followed his graduation in 1950 from West Point. Now an Air Force colonel, the 40-year-old Borman is married and has two teenage sons. James Lovell, the pilot of the Apollo Command module, is also 40 and flew with Borman on the two-week flight of Gemini 7. Lovell, a Navy captain and graduate of Annapolis, actually replaced astronaut Mike Collins on Apollo 8 after Collins ran into medical problems from a bone spur on the neck. Lovell is married and has four children. The youngest Apollo 8 crew member, Lunar Module Pilot William Anders, 35, was a space rookie until this flight. 
He's a major in the Air Force and also a graduate of Annapolis. In addition, he has a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Anders, too, is married and has five children. So these three men, joined in a spectacular adventure. Last Saturday morning, took their final walk across the Earth before leaving it for more than six days. With Borman in the lead, the three astronauts suited up and carrying portable air conditioners, headed for the van which would take them to the launch site for the elevator ride to the top of the 36-story tall Saturn V moon rocket. Here's how it went as we reported it, starting with the voice of Jack King at Mission Control. Ten. Nine, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are armed. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit, we have, we have put it on. Lift down the sun, D1 AM Eastern Standard Time. Looks good. We'll clear the tower. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. It looks good, it looks like a good fight. It's a beautiful takeoff so far. This building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. But what a beautiful flight. Man, perhaps on the way to the moon. It all continues to go well. And our great BU cameras are picking up the spacecraft. 25 the more seconds, engines. the other four engines of the first stage should cut out. Two minutes, 25 seconds. The rocket then will be 20 miles high and going 3,000 miles an hour. And there is the see, staging. Uh, an S1C, the first stage cut off. S2 has ignited, we can confirm. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Two and a half hours after that perfect liftoff came the historic decision. Go for the moon. And this is how it sounded. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. Go for TLI. Translunar injection meaning to fire up the third stage engine to drive the astronauts up to a speed of more than 24,000 miles per hour, break them free of Earth orbit, and send them off to where no man had ever gone, toward the moon. During that early part of the voyage, the Apollo 8 crew went through a rehearsal of part of the maneuvers to be carried out on the way to the first lunar landing attempt. At the front of the third stage, just behind the spacecraft, is a compartment for carrying the lunar excursion module, the bug-like vehicle that actually is to put U.S. astronauts on the moon's surface next year. When the third stage separates, its forward panels are to break open, exposing the LEM, as it's called. Those future astronauts in their spacecraft ahead of the third stage then will turn their capsule around. They'll maneuver back, hook onto the LEM, and pull it free. There was no LEM aboard this trip, but on the lunar landing flight, there will be, flying in tandem toward the moon. But this time, what eventually will act as the mothership, the spacecraft, flew on alone, aiming only to achieve lunar orbit. On Sunday, one day along on their half a million mile round trip, the astronauts became sick. Borman apparently was hit by a 24-hour flu, while Lovell and Anders just weren't feeling well. But their illnesses quickly cleared up in time for them to send back the first of the long-awaited live television pictures. Initially, problems with the small camera's telephoto lens frustratingly resulted in man seeing his first long-range view of the Earth as a big white blob, although the interior shots of the spacecraft were just fine. Okay, we're rolling around to a uh, good view of the Earth, and uh, as soon as we get to the uh, good view of the Earth, we'll stop and let you look out the window at the scene we see. Jim Wobble's down in the lower equipment bay preparing uh, lunch. And, and uh, and Bill is uh, holding a camera here for us both. Do we have a picture? Uh, He's in nothing. Okay, it's a little difficult to see what we have. That's the Earth. But it's not the telephoto lens, unfortunately. It's just a regular inside lens. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway. 
halfway between the moon and the earth. And we've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. You can see Bill's got his toothbrush here. He's been brushing his teeth regularly to demonstrate how things float around zero G. Looks like you're placing the asteroid the way he tries to catch that thing. I certainly wish we could uh, show you the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view with uh, predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds, uh, particularly one very strong vortex up near the Terminator. It's very, very beautiful. Happy birthday, Mother. Ground Control told the astronauts how to fix the camera before the second telecast, which came Monday from more than 200,000 miles out. Hope that everyone enjoy the picture that we're taking of themselves. How far away from Earth now, Jim, about? We have you about 180,000. Looking at yourself. All right, you're all looking at yourselves as seen from 180,000 miles out in space. Michael, I uh, keep imagining this if I'm a lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Don't see anybody waiting, is that what you're saying? Thank you. Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. You better hope we land in the blue part. So are we, babe. Jim is always for land landing. To give you some idea of like, what we can uh, see, we can, uh, I can pick out the uh, southwest coastline of the Gulf and where Houston uh, should be, and also the mouth of the Mississippi. I can see Baja, California, and that particular area. I'm using a binocular, which we have aboard. All right, well, we're seeing uh, the entire uh, Earth now, including the, the Terminator. Of course, we can't see anything uh, past the Terminator at all. Are you able, with your binoculars, to see uh, the, the dark horizon or anything past the Terminator? Uh, negative, uh, Mike. We can't see anything past the Terminator with the binoculars or without them. The flight continued on near perfect course. The spacecraft now in the dominant pull of the moon's gravity being dragged along faster and faster. The first men in history to reach the moon now were preparing to go around it, losing all contact with Earth while they traveled across the backside where they would perform the critical braking maneuver needed to achieve orbit. Thank you, uh, Houston, Maui. Uh, Roger, Frank, the custard's in the oven at 350. Current altitude away from the moon, uh, 377 nautical miles. You heard the remark of Jim Lovell, uh, thanks a lot, troops. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. It was an agonizing wait for those back on Earth. This animation shows how the 20,000 pound thrust spacecraft engine was fired to slow the capsule and prevent it from whipping around the moon and heading back toward Earth. The initial blast was to put the Apollo 8 into an elliptical orbit to be corrected later to a near circular path 69 miles above the lunar surface. But on the ground, no one yet knew if that braking maneuver had worked or even taken place. And then, as Apollo 8 came around the moon, voice contact again was established. We've got it, Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a cheer in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston, uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Lovell. First status report, Apollo 8 as follows. Burn on time. Burn time, four minutes, six 
Almost on top of the success of achieving lunar orbit came Apollo 8's first live television pictures of the moon's forbidding surface. just referred to was executed perfectly, putting Apollo 8 into the proper 69-mile-high circular orbit. Later that night, there was another telecast in which the astronauts described their thoughts on what lay below them. It is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I think that each one, of, uh, each one uh, carries his own impression of what, of what he sees and today. Uh, I think that uh, the astronauts in the The flight of Apollo 8 was a spectacular success even before the crew began their risky flight back to Earth. 
Soviet space scientist Leonid Satov said as the homeward journey began, this event goes beyond the limits of a national achievement and marks a stage in the development of the culture of Earthmen. But the flight also was a great national achievement, and this was noted by three of the Western world's leading scientists. Our correspondents interviewed Britain's Sir Bernard Lovell, U.S. Nobel laureate Harold Urey, and American astrogeologist Eugene Shoemaker. First, Lovell. In purely scientific terms uh, for astronomy, uh, for example, uh, how do you view uh, Apollo 8? Is this... Uh, is there a lot of new information for you uh, yes. come out of this? I doubt if there will be a tremendous amount new as far as the astronomers are concerned from Apollo 8, but of course it was never intended to be a purely scientific enterprise. For science, the significance of the flight is that it is an, an immensely important stepping stone to the whole Apollo program, which we hope will now end up by getting the American on the moon in 1969. And then the astronomers like myself will be very, very interested indeed in the material which is returned home. What about the, uh, the photographs? Uh, they should have, uh, for example, yes. still pictures yes. back from this. Yes, I, I imagine that when we see those photographs, they, they really will be quite splendid and marvelous. But of course, so have the photographs sent back by the lunar orbiters uh, and the surveyors. They have also uh, given many revelations about the nature of the moon. Therefore, I don't think we ought to expect too much from the purely scientific point of view from Apollo 8. Is this really a, a springboard then? Yes, I think it is. It's an, a springboard and uh, an amazing demonstration of American competence and virility. I, I, many tributes have been paid to the engineering excellence, but what amazes me also is the, why well, I think you call it the logistics, the, organization and management of this vast project. After all, it's only uh, less than eight years since uh, President Kennedy started off the program, and the accomplishment in that time, in spite of the setbacks, is really stupendous. We must remember that, that it is not primarily a scientific business at all. It is done uh, uh, as the pyramids were built, or as the Parthenon was built, something we can do that's magnificent and wonderful. Man is made that way. Whenever there's a challenge of this kind, someone somewhere will pick it up. We will go to the South Pole or the North Pole or climb Mount Everest or do things of this sort. Why does man pick up a challenge like this, Doctor? I don't know. He's made that way. He's done it all through history. And now we've come to a point in which we can go to the moon. And somewhere, someone is going to go to the moon. And I would be very sorry indeed if my country, the richest, the most powerful country in the world, didn't try to do it. And didn't try to do it first, as a matter of fact. I think there's a much stronger purpose, a national purpose, in going into space. And that has to do with the fact that Space is there now within our grasp. It's, it's now within the possibility to be explored. We have the technique to do it, but it requires a great deal of effort. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I think by this nation reaching out, by striving to do this, and by being bold enough to go ahead and explore, not just the moon, but beyond the moon, later on, other terrestrial planets, We'll be engaging in an activity that leads us on as a nation. It gives us forward momentum to do this. If one looks back through history, you will find that most nations or societies that have, that have come to prominence in history have been ones that were actively reaching out in one way or another, exploring in one way or another. I think it's an index of the, of the spirit of the people at that time, as well as of their technical ability. I think it's very, very important for the national spirit that we do this. And science and the technological uh, byproducts that come out of this are just that, they're byproducts. But they're not the real reason for going into space. Period in lunar orbit was spent taking more film and still photographs. From these, scientists will learn more than they've ever known about the Earth's nearest neighbor in the universe and pick the spot where the first US astronauts are to land. On Christmas Day, the Apollo crew, after circling the moon 10 times in just 20 hours, was ready to head for home. But as before, 
A critical maneuver had to be performed while the spacecraft was behind the moon. We will see what happened in animation while hearing the actual transmission at the time from Mission Control. And uh, here in Mission Control Center, we've just counted down to the burn. We should have uh, ignition at this time. That will be a three minute and 18 second burn nominally. Uh, it will increase the spacecraft velocity by about 3,522 feet per second or some 2,395 miles per hour. Following the maneuver, the spacecraft should have a uh, velocity of about uh, 8,800 feet per second, uh, some 6,000 miles per hour. But no one on the ground could know if the spacecraft were going that fast until it re-emerged from behind the moon a few minutes later. A few minutes later, it did. One of the most dramatic moments of the trip. Later came a Christmas Day telecast. What we thought we'd do today was just show you a little bit about life inside the Apollo 8. We've shown you the scenes of the moon, scenes of the earth, and uh, we thought we'd invite you into our, our home. It's been our home at least for uh, four days. You can see on the, the uh, instrument panel, we, uh, we mark off each day on the uh, on the instrument panel, we've four down and we're working on the fifth day. Of course, we're all looking forward to the uh, landing on Friday. And down here in the part of the spacecraft that we call the lower equipment bay, we have the president's advisor on physical fitness, Captain Jim Lovell, about to uh, undergo an exercise program that we, uh, we do every day. You notice that uh, he floats around very freely. Just bumped his head on the optics of our navigating. He's working with an exercise device that's designed to keep the muscles in shape. What do you have today, Bill, for uh, dinner? Well, here we have some cocoa. It'll be good. I'll be adding about five ounces of hot water to that. These are little uh, sugar cookies. Some orange juice. Corn chowder. Chicken and gravy. And a little napkin to wipe your hands when you're done. I'll prepare some orange juice here. I hope that you all had better Christmas dinners today than this, but uh, nevertheless, we thought like you might be interested in how we eat. Right. Sam, there any complaints around here, Frank? We, uh, we'll bring you up to speed on your food when you get back. Down in this area, it's called the LAB, or the Lower Equipment Bay. And we have our optics uh, positioning equipment right here. We do all our navigation down here by setting on stars and on the horizons of either the moon or the Earth. And this is where we find out exactly where we are in space, what direction, how fast we're traveling. And our computer, as uh, Frank had mentioned, that takes the information and tells us how to maneuver to get home safely. I work with the scanning telescope and the sextant and occasionally, if I get too busy, I just sort of float out of, out of sight and go up into the tunnel, which is the tunnel to the hatch of the lunar module, which we don't have a board, of course. Now, well, that's about all we have for today. I, uh, each and every one of us which each, wish each and every one of you a very Merry Christmas. The next day, more than halfway home, the astronauts transmitted their sixth and last telecast from space. We hear first from Mission Control. The 
this view from Earth uh, with a telephoto lens at uh, some 97,000 nautical miles. And uh, on the Earth here, so far out in space, I uh, think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have. Going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back. And uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still, uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. And that's, uh, that's what you're seeing right here. Uh, Roger, Bill. We should be glad to get you back, too. This is Frank Borman. We, uh, we've enjoyed the uh, television shows, and uh, we invite you to stay uh, tuned in in the future because there'll be flights and uh, rendezvous in the Earth orbit, and then, of course, there'll be television from the lunar surface itself in the not too far distant future. So until then, I guess this is the Apollo 8 crew signing off, and uh, we'll see you back on that good Earth very soon. Roger, Frank. Adios. This morning, the perfect flight of the remarkable Apollo 8 ended in the pre-dawn darkness of the mid-Pacific, southwest of Hawaii. On target, on schedule. But before starting its long descent to splashdown, the cone-shaped command module carrying the astronauts had to separate from its service module and successfully penetrate one more barrier, the Earth's own atmosphere. The voice of mission control begins the last chapter of the flight story. The flight director has confirmed separation. The separation of the command module and the service module. We've been looking at data on the command module alone, and all the values look quite good. The total blackout we're predicting this morning is on the order of three minutes. But since we have very little experience re-entering at these velocities, we uh, must caution you that those are only estimates. And we have lost signal. The, uh, our network controller says we lost signal at 1.46, 46 minutes, and uh, with very nearly 46 seconds. And our estimate is that this uh, blacked out period will, will continue, or let's see, three minutes. It's now uh, just two minutes past the time when we should have heard from the spacecraft through the blackout. Ken Mattingly puts in a, another call. And there's Jim Lovell. Ha-ha! He says we're looking good. I can't tell whether it's Borman or Lovell. Let's try to cut it in. We're real good shape, Real fine. 146 hours, 58 minutes, recovery two within the last minute. As reported, they have a flashing light in sight, and they followed that with, we have voice contact with the crew. Yes, uh, we saw the spacecraft coming down off the uh, port, uh, port side of the, uh, of the aircraft carrier, uh, a bright light in the sky, slowly descending toward the surface of the Pacific. It's now 5,000 yards from the Yorktown, and at just about this moment, it should be landing on the surface of the water. The astronauts waited patiently for more than an hour in their bobbing space capsule for dawn and the swimmers from the rescue helicopter hovering overhead. When dawn came, the astronauts climbed into a life raft and were hoisted aboard 80 minutes after splashdown. Astronaut Foreman and Lovell and Anders standing on the steps and a great cheer goes up from the sailors out here on the flight deck. All of them looking in very good condition, needing a shave, of course, shaking hands with Ben James. There's Captain Lowell shaking hands with Ben James. Walking slowly down the red carpet, accompanied by John Stone Cipher and Ben James. Colonel Borman, would you care to say a few words to the crew? Yes, sir, thank you. Well. We're just very happy to be here, and we uh, appreciate all your efforts. And I know you had to stay out here over Christmas, and that made it tough. I'm, uh, Jim and I always seem to fly in December. We made it home before Christmas in 65. But we, we can't tell you much how, 
as how much we really appreciate you being here and how proud it is for us to participate in this event because thousands of people made this possible and I guess we're all just part of the group. Thank you very much. Then there was the traditional giving of ship's caps to the three astronauts who, when everybody stopped to think about it, were the first visitors from space they'd ever had. The astronauts then were taken to the ship's sick bay for medical exams while the Navy began the task of recovering the precious Apollo 8 space capsule. Before the astronauts arrived on the carrier, President Johnson placed a call to talk to them from Washington. They later listened to a tape recording of the president's words. You've taken us, taken all of us, all over the world into a new era. And my thoughts this morning went back to more than 10 years ago in the Pernalis Valley when we saw Sputnik uh, uh, racing through the skies and we realized that America had a big job ahead of it. It gave me so much pleasure to know that you men uh, have done a large part of that job. So uh, we rejoice that you're well and we send you congratulations from all of your fellow countrymen and from uh, all uh, peace-loving people in the world. The president spoke of the Russian launching of the original Sputnik more than 11 years ago, a fact which jolted many Americans into thinking seriously about space for the first time. CBS News did a broadcast on the subject that winter, and I was the correspondent. Let's go back in time now and look at our evaluation of the then brand new space race. Just three months ago, last October 4th, a new moon no bigger than the span of a man's arm came over the horizon and cast a different light on our affairs. Sputnik was a serious threat, if not to our immediate security, then to our sense of security. It shook the confidence of our allies, the respect of the neutrals. Moscow's mood has been one of new confidence, exultation in the Soviet press. Ours, a Soviet Sputnik, is first in the world. Entire world ecstatic over great victory of Soviet science. First step into the cosmos, Sputnik over all continents. In the race for control of the moon's surface, here's where we stand. Here's our first space vehicle, still on the ground. It might have been launched more than a year ago, a year ahead of the Russians. Originally, there was a joint Army-Navy project to put a satellite into orbit in 1956 using military rocketry. But the White House deliberately canceled that in favor of the lower priority scientific program. Right now, there is no problem in the theory or technique of orbiting a satellite that we haven't licked. But it's a laboratory licking. We need tests and more tests. And every quantity of tests, there's a definite number of failures. The Russians keep their failures to themselves. We don't. To sum up, in satellites, we are a year behind the Russians, the year we lost in the switch from the military to the scientific program. We hope to make up some time by using satellites with better instruments than theirs contain and thereby collect more information with ours. But the Russians are gathering valuable data right now. Since those dark days of 1958, the United States, too, has been gathering valuable data in flight after flight, suborbital, orbital, spacewalks, rendezvous, and now the trip to the moon. And so far as can be foretold, the United States is likely to put a man on the moon before its Soviet space competitor. At the very hour of splashdown, we sent cameras to look at the bizarre craft which is slated for the riskiest space job of all, landing on and leaving from the moon. The particular vehicle designated to take two astronauts to the surface of the moon in mid-1969 is being prepared today by Grumman engineers at Bethpage, Long Island. This is lunar module number five to be attached to Apollo 11. Here is the cabin in which two astronauts will stand. Workmen are making final adjustments on the instrument panels. This is the hatchway down to the lunar surface. The descent to the moon will be slowed by an engine sheathed in plastic for protection and shipment. This is it. Various antennae will aid the lunar landers in rendezvous and docking and in conversation with each other. The radar antenna has been removed for safety during the flight to Cape Kennedy. Perhaps the most critical engine on LEM is this one, 
the engine that is to lift the upper stage off the moon and get the astronauts back to their command vehicle for return to Earth. It's a smaller version of the same engine that got the Apollo 8 astronauts in and out of lunar orbit and back on course for the Earth. There have been some troubles with the lunar module. In fact, Apollo 8 was originally intended to test the module in Earth orbit, but the module wasn't ready. Now the question is whether it will be ready and safe for the next test and for the moon landing before the end of 1969. In our space center, Mike Wallace talks with a senior Grumman engineer about that and about how LEM works. This strange looking bird, the LEM, Mr. Kelly, how does it work? Well, this is the spacecraft that's used to take men down to the lunar surface. And uh, it's docked to the command module, which uh, the conical shape part of the spacecraft docks to the top of LEM here. And two of the three astronauts enter LEM by crawling in through this tunnel. Once inside, they detach the LEM from the command and service modules. And using this throttleable descent rocket engine, they descend to the lunar surface. That's the only throttleable rocket engine known to man, I gather. Yes, it is. It has to be throttleable in order to land very softly on the surface with the landing gear, as you see here. Then what? Well, once on the surface, the astronauts uh, will come out through the front hatch here and climb down this ladder to explore the lunar surface. They'll take out some scientific equipment from one of the bays here. Uh, when they've completed their experiments, they re-enter the LEM, and the upper portion of the LEM detaches from the lower portion. Hopefully. And this is called the, oh, definitely. And this is called the ascent stage. And we blast off from the lunar surface using this rocket engine here, the ascent rocket engine. We then rendezvous into lunar orbit with the waiting command and service module. We're tracking them all the time with our rendezvous radar. You can see the antenna from that here. Now, there's no backup system on this ascent uh, module, is there? No, it has to work in order to get the men safely home. When they turn the ignition, if nothing happens, then there's just no way for anybody, any place to help them. That's correct. That's why we've made it as simple and reliable as we possibly can. Is that why you are overdue with the LEM? I gather that it's somewhat behind schedule, and there's been some skepticism as to whether you were going to make it in time for Apollo. Well, you didn't make it for Apollo 8, which was supposed to be a a LEM mission? Well, we were very close on Apollo 8. We were having some uh, uh, relatively minor troubles with electromagnetic interference on our spacecraft at the Cape at the time that the missions were being reviewed. Now, it, it also happened that NASA was quite interested in performing the type mission that we just saw on Apollo 8 because they could have, uh, without LEM being there, they could take additional fuel reserves for the lunar orbit. So that's why they went that way. Apollo 9, the next one, the LEM goes along, but this is just Earth orbit. What happens with LEM? LEM will rehearse uh, in Earth orbit the, uh, all the steps except actual landing for the lunar mission. We will fire both of our rocket engines. Uh, we will uh, separate the, the ascent from the descent stages and go through the entire uh, mission. We will even uh, practice an emergency procedure, which is uh, walking in space from the forward hatch of LEM into the side hatch of the command module. Then Apollo 10, you're going all the way to the moon, and LEM is going to descend, I understand, to within 50,000 feet of the moon's surface. Yes, Apollo 10 will at least go out into the vicinity of the moon. Is it possible that Apollo 10 will actually land on the moon? It's possible, but I'd say not likely. We think we'll probably want the two full manned missions before we actually go for the landing. Mr. Kelly, is the LEM ready? Yes, sir. And you'd go along? Right, right today. <laughs>
the transfer van now departing from the crew quarters at the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building here at the Kennedy Space Center on the start of the trip to the launch pad. For three hours, 10 minutes, 20 seconds, and counting, we'll go on the Apollo 12 countdown at this time. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five. Testing, testing. You are right there. Now okay, you're come here, on, sir. You're blocked by these two buses. Okay, the first right. is the FBI 45 for him. Okay, Lee. Yeah. We'll lift the rope. Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Studio. <laughs> no, I don't mind remote. Do you know why this walkway is divided? And I have do you no know idea. which side the president's going to walk down? Uh, I don't know at all. I, I can't find it's kind of a mystery. Knows. It's kind of a mystery well, to me. I wish you'd walk down, down over there. It'd be easier to cover on camera. Yeah. Uh, the reason I put this thing out here, well, I can I can put it. Well, we're, as long as uh, it's here, I'll tell you, we'll set the shot now. Okay, well, it's going to be roughly in here might go a foot or two either way if they want it on that side of the rope fine i'll put it there but i i have not yet been able to get a uh, decision on it and so it falls to me to make the decision as to where he's going to speak from uh, so it'll be right around in this area generally lined up with this crack in the pavement here because I want to get them far enough behind these speakers so when they put it on the PA, we don't get feedback.
Okay, I'll go crank it up, and then will I send it back to you and we can test it? I'll crank up the level. Huh? What do you mean they won't send it back here? They're supposed to. They're supposed to. It's for the PA system. Fine, let's have it. That's what we intended. If the president speaks, that's exactly where we want it to go, all over the whole place, over the PA system here, and they can pipe it anywhere they want because it's public remarks. It's not off the record. Well, we got to test the bloody thing some way. I want that test done. I don't care who's up there. The White House wants that test done. I'll give them a higher level. I'm going to I'm going to make a test count, maybe 1 through 10 and then back down to 0. Right. Just like if the president was talking. Right, just like if the president was talking. It'll be a short test. They're probably hearing what I say now, so uh, that's why I'm close up to the microphone. It'll be a short test. I'm not going to talk very long. I just want to make sure this PA system works. Thank you. Okay, I'll I'll go turn it up now. Testing, testing, testing. This is a test. Testing, testing, testing. This is a test. This is a test. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 2 hours, 58 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting. The Apollo 12 crewmen aboard their transfer van now going down the last leg on their trip to the launch pad. They're on the main road now. They've gone past the Launch Control Center and are heading down. Uh, they'll be coming up shortly on the Mobile Service Structure Park site, and then we'll make the turn toward Pad A. It's uh, about 18 minutes that we give... Uh, the transfer van to make the trip from the crew quarters to the launch pad. Once the astronauts do arrive at the pad, they'll board uh, one elevator that will take them inside the mobile launcher and a second high-speed elevator that will take them up uh, the mobile service structure to the 320-foot level from where they will board their Apollo 12 spacecraft. The backup command module pilot, Al Warden, is aboard the spacecraft at this time as he has been for the last 30 or 40 minutes or so performing a final checks of switches 
uh, and the Water and Environmental Control System in preparation for the arrival of the crew. Standing, uh, standing by in the White Room, awaiting the arrival of the astronauts, are the pad leader, a command module technician, and a quality control a representative. We expect the crew to board the spacecraft starting at the two hour, 40 minute mark in the count. This is the way it is according to the book, which would be some 17 minutes from this time. It could be earlier depending on their arrival. We had some rain in the launch pad area. It's difficult to tell whether, we still, whether it is still raining at this time in the pad area. However, uh, the weather forecast still stands as acceptable for our launch attempt at 11.22 a.m. We're continuing to monitor the status of the launch vehicle here in the firing room at the uh, launch control center. All is well with the countdown at this time. We are go for Apollo 12. Two hours, 57 minutes, three seconds and counting. This is launch control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 2 hours, 53 minutes, 5 seconds and counting. 
The prime crew for Apollo 12 now has arrived at the launch pad. The three crewmen are aboard the first of two elevators they'll use to get to the 320-foot level. They're now joined in the elevators by the two suit technicians. The first elevator will take them to the A level inside the mobile launcher. Once inside, they will walk uh, through the A level of the mobile launcher to catch one of the two high-speed elevators that are located uh, at the A level. These elevators can travel at 600 feet per minute. They will take the uh, astronauts, all three crewmen, up to the 320-foot level from where Conrad and Bean will cross the swing arm to approach the white room where their spacecraft is located. The astronauts now going into the A level of the mobile launcher. They step across a bulkhead, walk down a short hall, and then aboard a waiting elevator. This elevator is controlled by the capsule communicator here in the firing room who is astronaut Paul Weitz for this mission. The astronaut, the 11, the Apollo 12 astronauts now going down the hall, they'll board the high-speed elevator and should be up uh, near the spacecraft shortly. Two hours, 51 minutes, 48 seconds and counting. This is launch control. the Apollo Saturn launch control, T-minus, two hours, 48 minutes, 56 seconds, and counting. The astronauts have arrived in the white room, that is the spacecraft commander, Pete Conrad, and the lunar module pilot, M. Allen Bean. The third member of the crew, astronaut Dick Gordon, will stand by in an elevator located on the mobile launcher at the 320-foot level. He is in the company of a suit technician and will be called across the swing arm after his two colleagues go aboard. The spacecraft commander, Pete Conrad, now boarding the spacecraft. He sits in the left-hand seat. We have him over the sill at 33 minutes past the hour. 8.33 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Pete Conrad is aboard the Apollo 12 spacecraft. Astronaut Al Warden, the backup command module pilot, will be a fourth astronaut in the spacecraft for some 30 or 40 minutes. He's inside now, and he will give a hand 
in seating all three astronauts in their couches. Warden will work in the front of the spacecraft, that is in front of the couches, giving a hand, while the suit technician works in the rear, that is behind each couch. So at certain points we will have actually five people in the spacecraft, the three crewmen, the backup command module pilot Al Warden, and just inside the spacecraft, the suit technician. And Warden and the suit technician will uh, give a hand in getting the astronauts uh, seated snugly into their couches and help them with their preliminary checks. Alan Bean, the lunar module pilot, who'll sit in the right-hand seat, uh, should be coming across the sills shortly. Dick Gordon, as uh, we reported, still standing by in an elevator on the other side of the Apollo access arm. The spacecraft test conductor has just made a communications check and received a cheery good morning, good morning from Pete Conrad, the spacecraft commander. That is our status at this time. We're two hours, 47 minutes and counting, theoretically some seven or eight minutes ahead of the planned procedure time for astronaut ingress. All still, still going well at this time with Conrad aboard, uh, being standing by in the white room, and Dick Gordon uh, still awaiting the call in the elevator at the 320-foot level. This is launch control.
Launch Control, the spacecraft commander, astronaut Pete Conrad, now fitted snugly into his couch on the left-hand seat of the Apollo 12 spacecraft, and the space, uh, space suit technician and backup command module pilot Al Warden, now giving astronaut Alan Bean a hand in checking him out. In each case, as an astronaut uh, is uh, brought in to the spacecraft, he goes through the same sequence, that is to hook up a communications cable, then actually hook uh, the astronaut and his uh, uh, pressurized garment into the suit circuit system of the spacecraft to bring the oxygen flow uh, to the suit. This is followed by some uh, communications checks, and uh, finally we get some preliminary medical readouts on each astronaut, and in a final uh, check to assure that everything is okay, the spacecraft conduct test conductor, in each case, asked the astronaut to check some panels nearby to assure that as he came aboard, he might not have inadvertently hit some of the switches. So in each case, we have a switch list check, a brief one. We expect that the spacecraft test conductor, Chip, Skip Chauvin, will be calling the third member of the crew, Dick Gordon, to come across the swing arm shortly. We'll be standing by. We appear to be right on time as far as our procedures are concerned. Uh, here in the firing room, the crew continuing to monitor the status of the Saturn V launch vehicle as we continue with crew ingress. We're now at 2 hours, 36 minutes, 26 seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo 12 on our launch attempt with the window starting and the window opening at 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus two hours, 28 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. Still go with Apollo 12 at this time. At the 320 foot level at launch pad A, where the hatch for the Apollo 12 spacecraft is located, we now have the third member of the crew aboard, Dick Gordon, a command module pilot who sits in the middle seat of the spacecraft, uh, came aboard the spacecraft at 46 minutes past the hour. We boarded all three astronauts in a span of about 13 minutes. At this time, the spacecraft test conductor uh, talking with the crew in the white room and aboard the spacecraft, going through the final checks of getting astronaut Dick Gordon aboard, getting him checked into the couch, tied into the suit circuit system, having him check a few switches to ensure that he did not bump any uh, on the ingress activity. We still have the suit technician in the spacecraft, and uh, in front in the lower equipment bay is Al Warden, also giving a hand as we go through the preliminary uh, check out of the three pilots aboard. Uh, we'll make a, get a quick medical readout here shortly on Dick Gordon. And then a Houston flight. Uh, Mission Control Center Houston is standing by to perform some communication checks with the astronauts aboard the spacecraft. All still going well uh, with the count. Weather is go. And uh, we're still aiming toward our planned T0 at 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Two hours, 27 minutes, 29 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
Broadcast man. This is Palo Saturn Launch Control, T minus two hours, 18 minutes, 35 seconds and counting. Still proceeding on schedule, in fact, a few minutes ahead of schedule in our preparations for the launch of Apollo 12. Our checkout in the spacecraft uh, command module going well at the 320 foot level. We've just had uh, Al Warden, who was uh, for a while the fourth astronaut aboard the spacecraft. He has just come out after giving the three prime pilots a hand on uh, their preliminary checkout. We'll be ready in a short while here, perhaps a little ahead of time, uh, to close the hatch. And we'll be coming up with uh, some more command checks from the Mission Control Center in Houston. These are checks in which uh, Houston can send commands to the spacecraft, and the astronauts confirm that these commands have been received and uh, actually accepted by the spacecraft computer. This is a requirement, of course, for launch, that uh, following liftoff, if necessary, direct commands could be sent from the ground to update uh, the spacecraft computer. Our countdown still going normally here in firing room two, the crew continuing to monitor the overall status of the Saturn V launch vehicle, keeping a close eye on the various propellants aboard, and all our propellants are stable as the countdown uh, continues. All still going well, the pad leader has just reported that he's ready to close the hatch, and it looks like hatch closure is coming up in a matter of seconds. The hatch being closed now at about five minutes past the hour. Uh, we seem to be progressing very well in our work up there at the 320-foot level with the three astronauts and their preliminary checkouts aboard Apollo 12. Two hours, 16 minutes, 57 seconds and counting. We are still go on Apollo 12. This is Kennedy Launch Control. <laughs> 